This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetisy. I'm Bridget Fetisy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. This week's sponsor is Fetacy Inc. Fetacy Inc. just wants to make you laugh while the world burns. So buy our mugs and t-shirts. <laughs> and this week, they're offering 15% off all merch at BridgetFetacy.com with user code WALKIN. <laughs> This week on the podcast, I have my very good friend, Jessica Michelle Singleton. She's quirky, dark, and dirty. She's an internationally headlining comedian, consistently touring throughout North America, Europe, Asia, and South Africa. She is a beloved paid regular at the Comedy Store, and her debut comedy album, Please Don't Leave Me, reached number one on iTunes and was considered for a Grammy for Best Comedy Album. Additionally, she is the host of the popular podcast Ignorance is Hashtag Blessed and co-hosts the new interactive podcast Name That Pod alongside her best friend, comedian Nicole Amy Schreiber. Jessica and I go pretty deep and we also laugh a lot at the darkness that is our upbringing. So enjoy. I'm with Jessica Michelle Singleton, everyone. Yay! Hi, I've, I've been. You've been on the Trello board as a guest since we launched. I'm so honored. I'm glad Which I'm here. I feel like now, a, almost a year ago, it'll be this week. A year Yay, ago. Yeah. Congrats. So That's you're great. One of the people I've been dying to get on. I've been like wanting to just. I wanted to just sit down with you. I know. Forever. We just need to hang out. Really. I know. <laughs> I'm like, oh, it's every time I see you, I'm like, why don't we hang out? <laughs> yes. And then it's like, I want to get over this. I think it's like the LA industry mentality of like, oh, you're like, why do we need to make everything? I always feel like it has to be work related. Yeah. That's the thing. I'm not to be the person who's like in therapy, but I'm actively working on like, no, just making time to like hang out with humans and no we can talk be about therapy yes we're, oh. we're such white girls our therapy was at the same time today that's so funny it's like, <laughs> well let's push it because i have therapy you have therapy <laughs> oh. we both had therapy today we're mm. gonna process our therapy sessions it's so true other. it's like oh let me go talk openly right after a therapy session <laughs> that's a fucking slippery slope i know i was thinking about that <laughs> being like after just, my therapy session I'm like really a lot came up i can't wait to process this on my podcast that's like i just let i just want to talk about my workaholism and how like i want to make time to care for myself and i just <laughs> which is like what a fucking yeah exactly white lady first world problem to be in therapy <laughs> talking about how i don't make enough time for therapy <laughs> and it's like what am i doing why and then Halfway through every session, I want to I wanna be like, why am I here? Yeah. I'm wasting your time, sir. Someone else needs more help. Yeah. You <laughs> should be donating this second half of this session to someone in need. Yeah, because then, <laughs> then it's like, I just, for sure, if I was organized in my issues, could utilize the session. <laughs> but I show up and then halfway through, I'm like... Hmm. it's like being at an open mic with no material i'm like well, what else i guess my mother like i just then i start digging and now i'm like i'm used i'm now looking for problems for therapy because you go in with a flow chart yeah i'm like You're well like, well i've got a spreadsheet of the topics we normally cover yeah and i'm like now this is becoming a metaphor for my life because i'm now in therapy looking for issues when my issue right now is that I keep looking for issues <laughs> is that I'm trying to find a problem. Your therapy th is just meta now. It It's so ridiculous. Well, cause it's like, why aren't we drinking pumpkin spice lattes? I mean, we are drinking harvest tea. Yeah. Hot tea. And I, I was like, no, I'm fine. I'll keep drinking my diet Mountain Dew, <laughs> which by the way, my therapist who's like a 70 year old man drinks. That's hilarious. So I, he was drinking it and I was like, you know what? I haven't had one of those in a while. And I'm like, my therapist is low key. He's alive. Yeah, he's fine. But I was like, is this, my therapy is making me have, worse habits yeah <laughs> you're like i shouldn't be coming out of therapy with a diet mountain dew addiction you're like let's get jacked up <laughs> that's i just need to feel more at a higher volume <laughs> so tell us who you are what are you what are you in los angeles i pursuing? am <sighs> for who some fucking stupid reason i'm in los angeles pursuing stand-up comedy and which <laughs> is somewhat counterintuitive i think sometimes i moved out here like i want to be a stand-up comedian you go to new york you go to la yeah 
I visited LA, met a man who turned out to be like a crackpot like manager, but he's like, move to LA. And I was like, this is how it happens. I'm going to be a star. <laughs> I think when I first started, <laughs> I kind of thought I wanted to do everything. Like I'll do stand up. I'll maybe I'll be in movies. And by the way, I'm not like turning down offers left and right to be in feature <laughs> films, but I just love stand up so much that I'm, I've hit a point where like, it's going well enough that I can survive. Good. And thank you. And I mean that at a very base level. It's like I can squeak by and pay my bills. Yeah. And now it's like the other stuff you almost have to do if you want to be a stand-up comedian to supplement it to keep that sustaining. Right. You know, there's so many. You you need to get a show to be your day job so yeah. that you can keep doing stand-up. Yeah, as my passion, which is like <laughs> so silly, but I get it. So now... I've spent years like grinding and making stand up work just so I could squeak by. And that was my only goal, by the way, when I started, I was like, I want to be able to make a living doing stand up comedy. I want to be a paid regular at the comedy store. When did, so where are you from? I grew up in Anchorage, Alaska. Wow. Yeah. Very weird. Very, uh, well, not weird. It's just people always go like, Oh, cause it's, it's Alaska. It's a destination place. It seems so far away and it's, Everyone has their weird perceptions of like, that's where people go to escape. Do you have 40 days of night? Did you live yeah. in an igloo? And it's like, no, we do get down to like two hours, two or three hours of daylight, which does drive you insane. Oh, I would imagine. I don't know. Would that drive me insane? I don't You don't think so. Until I don't know if it drove me insane. It. it just made me like, it, like lean into the depression. We have like a very high rate of suicide, yeah. drug use, yep. murder. I have... Yep. I have a lot of domestic abuse. Oh yes. And and rape. And like, I have a cartoonish amount of dead friends. Yeah. They, they make, they murder a lot of women up there. Yes. Yeah. Just, I mean, I have a friend when I was in high school, a friend was brutally murdered. And then I have multiple friends that were murdered in high school. And it was so what happens there that it took me a little while when I moved away for like, for me to be like, Oh wow. You're, you're taken out because your dog died. Right. Like meeting people who are like, I just mittens was <laughs> such a great, and, and I totally get the love of an animal and the love of, but like, I've just become so numb that I'm like, yeah. wow, what a life you've led that this is, you're calling out of work because of the cat you rescued. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm just, and I'm like, I know I'm the more fucked up when I want to be in a place where I'm so like, I'm a loving person, but, Sometimes I'm like, oh, how fucked up am I from? God, my therapist and I were just talking about this too. Like death roulette. I'm just like, yeah, no, it's. Yeah. There's friends who when they call, I'm like, all right, who died? Like, I'm just like, what happened? But yeah. Are your parents still together? No. That's how we ended up in Alaska. My parents, my dad was in the military. Were you born in Alaska? No. I was born in Germany. Oh, okay. Military base. My dad got restationed when I was three years old in Mississippi. Okay. Uh, retired when I was maybe like first grade. Do you have siblings? I do. I have one older brother. And then once my mom got remarried, two younger stepbrothers. Okay. Um, so my older brother, maybe like a year and a half, bit of a problem child. Stepbrothers or half brothers? Younger ones. The younger ones step. Okay. So my mom met a guy yeah, when we moved to Alaska. Kids. Very quickly they were together. Yeah. Just a very big reflection of... My mom was the person who loudly would be like, all these women who need their men and it's like hey like this guy moved in and we've been here for a month yeah so like let's fucking take a step back all right (laughs) it's like now that you've transferred your alcoholism to some other type of addiction just fucking relax yeah but like yeah so i had one older brother like he was two grades ahead of me he is he's still alive he's not we're not we're not in school but like just i'm saying was i don't want people to be like what's the dark story here (laughs) although we did almost die like two years ago from drugs which is terrible, obviously. Yeah. It's just like, what do you, I don't know. I'm so disconnected from yeah. my family that it took a while for me to go like, oh no, it, to go, A, that's okay. It just is what it is. But then also, it it was hard for me to conceptualize of people being close to their family. See, I, I almost started crying when you were talking because I identify with this so much. Not even just close to the family, but my upbringing was a little bananas and yeah. we, I was just talking to my therapist about how I 
I'm like, I feel, am I missing something? And I, and I don't mean, and I was like, and I don't mean that. Like, I feel like I'm missing something with a deep connection and a family, but I'm like, why don't I feel like, like I am missing it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, why don't I, she's like, that's called dissociation and it's from your upbringing. And wow. I was like, no. Cause I was like, I feel broken. She's like, you are, you are, but you, <laughs> but the thing is, is, is like, I guess for therapy for me or just self, work for me has been like okay how much of is finding a line of like what what do i need to repair and what do i need to go this is how you are and you just got to go this is how i am yeah because yeah no i'm the exact same way of like i don't have this connection with my mother and then anytime i try to go like well maybe i should i don't yearn for the connection (laughs) i don't go like I just see other women being best friends with their mom and I wish, I'm like, no, I don't wish that was there. I just, but I do go, why don't I wish that was yeah, there? Yeah. Like, isn't, shouldn't I be it's wanting? It's like obser- observing human. I, I told her, I said, I feel like I'm a robot observing human yeah, behavior. Yeah, no, I, and I've always, a robot's a good way to put it. I've always gone like, I feel like I'm an alien. Yeah. Going like, oh, interesting, interesting. how you miss your family. <laughs> Because well, like truly, I get it. My my one of my best friends from college, my freshman year roommate, we lived you know in a like sixteen by twelve foot box together. Yeah. Just I went to school in Florida, and she I was in Tampa. Her family, she was from Orlando, so like two hour drive, and she would just you know like three weeks in, at, like got off the phone with her mom or something, and was crying, and I was like, "What happened?" She's like, "I just I miss my family," and I was like, uh, "What?" <laughs> like I literally I and to, like that was crazy to me and it took me a long time to and there is a line of some people are like in my opinion like a little cut the cord you know yeah, but like yeah. <laughs> but to go like oh I'm kind of the one that I'm I'm the, I'm one. the odd one out here yeah yeah like but going like like it's do you just I dated a guy who called his mom every day yeah and he said and he explained That's to him. me he was like look I know what, what that looks like it's not for me yeah my dad told me he's like you know you don't have to call every day but just so you know your mom is in a noticeably better mood when you call yeah so he's like so i call yeah which is nice yeah that's a nice. considerate thing it that is. was a good guy yeah who i left in a frenzy because i had like <laughs> a panic of like the layers are gonna come down he's gonna see who i really am and i'm a pile of trash i gotta get out of here oh god like which I. was my like mo for years yeah but to me i was like what like just every day yeah i was like i called my mom when i when she posts a suicidal meme on facebook and i go i guess and even that like the suicidal shit it's a point where like i feel bad that i'm like yeah i i worry about my mom because i society thinks i should worry about her right right like that i go hey mom what's up because if she kills herself then people then i have to go then i seem very callous if i go like well come on we all saw that coming (laughs) Like, I, there was nothing we could do. <laughs> but you can't just go, it's like, well, you did you try to do something? It's like, like, well, yeah, yeah, of course, for years. Yeah. But like, I've really spiraled D. This just turned into therapy real quick. No, it did happen. Well, no, it's just that, yeah, this is also so comforting to hear someone else go, yeah, no, I do. The, just the observing of not having the feelings. Yeah. Because, because yeah, that was my upbringing. It was like my mom has borderline personality disorder mm-hmm. and she'll tell you like oh yeah textbook i knew she had it because i i brought it up one time like when i tried therapy as an adult and i was like oh you know my therapist mentioned something about and i was like why am i i rarely talked to my mom but yeah. i was in like a suicidal spiral which i, I know it's bad when i reach out to my mom yeah because i'm yeah. like i guess i'll call my mom like, <laughs> like the person that I don't know that they're going to make this better, but yeah, that's like, I don't know who to call because I don't know how to reach out to anyone. Yeah. And I just somehow brought up, I was like, well, you know, my therapist brought up borderline personality disorder when I talked about our family dynamic. And she's like, well, yeah, no, of course I have, I have borderline personality disorder. <laughs> she's like, I mean, I had a therapist tell me that, but then also it's like, what do they know? And it's like, well, what a borderline thing to say. Yeah. Mother. yeah fuck them. Yeah, because like, because I, because I was like, I just, I called her like, I don't know why I'm calling you. I just feel like I'm spiraling out of control. I feel like I'm acting in ways that someone with an addiction acts, but I don't feel like I have an addiction I can yeah. pinpoint. And then she goes, "Of course, you're the child of an alcoholic." And I was like, <laughs> "Thank you for being so flippant that it's like, of course I have this problem because of your problems. <laughs> I'm cured." You're like that insight is genius and amazing, and you're also the problem. It's like so callous. 
<laughs> but that's just who she is. But like, so that's just been the dynamic of, so my dad retired from the military, which at the time I just was like, my dad's retiring. But like in retrospect, realistically with the very also callous uh, information I was given by my mother, it's like he was forced in early retirement. He mm-hmm. couldn't pass the promotion exam. And after a while they're like, get the fuck out. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> okay. So not a smart man. Um, but my mom was just always an alcoholic, just textbook borderline in that like if anyone who knows anything about borderline and i'm not saying this like boohoo and my mom and i have a relationship that's the best it could be now right because it just is what it is we communicate every once in a while she lives in south korea oh wow yeah, i know she works she has a government job and okay. so she's over there like on a contract for like i think another year maybe less but like we only can communicate via an app which you can call but it's texting and because of the distance it's like there isn't you know, it's like when you live in the same area, you have to go like, ah, should I try to? Yeah, yeah. I'm not sad about it. We get along. Yeah. We check in every couple of weeks. We How have, are you? We have exactly similar relationships. To our yes. Moms. And as long as I don't go deep diving on her Facebook, I don't worry. Or yeah, go like, yeah. come on, don't post that shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so anyways, like my dad, I don't know. What were we talking about? I'm just not telling dad, you my life story. Yeah. That's anyway. What this is though. So okay. your dad. Um, retired from the retired military. From- but then it was like he wasn't. He got retirement, but it wasn't a and substantial then, amount of money. So he was doing other jobs, which as a kid, you just go like, wow, my dad's so versatile. And it's like, no, my dad couldn't keep a job. Yeah. But I was like, he was a security guard. He worked at Walmart. It's like, he's doing it all. And it's like, no, we are a low income white trash family, barely staying afloat. And your dad is whatever. And so in any way, he got a job at a and shipyard. where were you? This was Southern Mississippi. Okay. Like Gulf Coast, he got a job working at a shipyard, which led to, and I, someone told me this is a common thing in that like job industry, but methamphetamines. Like, so he got into a crank is what he called it later when he just casually told me about it, (laughs) (laughs) but it's meth. So I didn't know he was on meth in the course of my parents, very violent uh, end of their marriage, Yeah, but a lot of loud fights, a lot of police showing up to be like, ah, what's going on here? Just, just all out drag out fights which i would they would just be like go to your room and, and how so, old were you um when my dad left i was like eight or nine okay so there was like a year or two period of being subjected to their i don't really remember anything and yeah. i don't know how much is suppression yeah and how much is like knowing how my brain works it would shock me to think i was an oblivious child yeah but maybe I was very good at tuning it out. I just remember when they were having their fights, it was just like, go to your room. And I would just go to my room and play with my dolls and turn on my radio and yep. just do do do. Because my brother will like vividly recall these. But he's older, right? He's older. Yeah. He's like a year and a half older. Yeah. I think that he was, he got in trouble a lot. So I think my dad leaving, he maybe took in it like in a different way right. personally. I didn't not, I didn't, it very much affected me, but yeah, I you think didn't internalize it. I didn't like go. He fault. left yeah. at, at that moment because of me. I didn't like consciously go. This is my fault. Right. Uh, but maybe I was so young. I couldn't wrap my head around that. But like, cause my dad left, he like left me in a restaurant and drove away. Whoa. Yeah. And then he came back a while later and was around for a few months. And then in the middle of the night, like gone. Wow. We didn't see him for months. And then when he finally came back, he had a new girlfriend. Uh, like My parents were already going through the act of divorce. Yeah. But the plan was like, he, it wasn't an agreed upon thing that my mom's like, well, you'll leave now. Like yeah. g- get out. It was like, he was just gone. Yeah. We woke up and there was just no dad. Um, and it was like, okay, well this happens, yeah. I guess. That's what dads do. That's what dads do sometimes. They just, and the the hardest part for me is like, and I'm, I'm fine with it now. I'm like at peace with it, whatever. But like at that, like my dad was my best friend. I was like uh, a daddy's girl. And not only that, but having a borderline mother. Oh, that's what I was saying. The textbook part of it is that borderline moms are, first of all, borderline, you're very black and white about things. Yeah. You either like think. Splitting. Yeah. You think something is the most amazing thing in the world or like that it's, evil and terrible and like and oftentimes you'll put someone on a pedestal and then they'll be teared down yeah and then it's like yeah if you would just approach this person like this is they're human and they're not going to be perfect but you go like they're amazing and then all of a sudden it's like disappoint you and and then the devil yes (laughs) which like 
when I was working and I'm still working through my mental health stuff, but that was the thing that I was like, is that what I'm doing that when I leave relationships, but I realized it was a very different, like fight or flight. Like, well, I guess when you are raised by narcissistic or borderline personality disorder yeah. individuals, you take on characteristics of them. Well, because that's what in you order learn. To survive. Yeah, you well, have to, you have to. And also in order to survive in particular, if they're borderline or narcissistic, because your needs as a kid aren't being met. No. And so you and they're, you're always taking care of their needs first. You have to learn how to work within that. It's, right. I mean, the, literally the book about recovering from having a narcissistic, I don't know if it's narcissistic, it's definitely borderline, which narcissism definitely falls in that umbrella too. Yeah. But like there's a book called Stop Walking on Eggshells. Uh, and it's like, li- because that's what you have to learn how to like maneuver around this adult to survive. And like, how can I get what I need without, rocking that boat because yeah. how dare you upset yeah. this parent how oh what are you crying about yeah. like that whole like oh you have no idea how hard it is like yeah. that very it's like my like what about my world and how that's falling apart it's like how dare as a child you need me to make you dinner you know when yeah. i'm emotionally crumbling yeah like yeah. whoa <laughs> like care for me because yeah and i it sounds like you have the same or a similar where it's like you become the parent almost. Yeah. I did. a. I didn't realize it until the past two years, how much thinking I do for everyone around me. Yes. I Assuming I didn't, I didn't know, I, you know, even dating the men I've dated in the past couple of like three, two to three years that we've had somewhat relationships even where I'll be like, Oh, I'll let you go because you don't know how to manage your time or, Oh, I'm always like caring for that person for them yeah, yeah. <laughs> where it's like it con- like i can take care of myself bridget i can make these decisions and i'm like you you can yeah where it's like <laughs> i'm not a fucking idiot and yeah. it's like well no but i just yeah and that's a thing is like i'm at that point now where trying to figure out how to love someone and show that i love them without thinking i have to yeah it's like if you don't have something I, you need me to do for you i don't know how you know i love you um, like if i'm not if I'm not almost parenting you, which is right, creepy. Right. I don't want to be someone's mom, right. but it's just the like, I immediately swoop in and I'm like, you obviously need help. Right. <laughs> That's my role in the world is to help someone. Yeah. I will tell you to get new sheets. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. you need to clean up your life. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, don't look in my bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> it's just clothes everywhere. Yeah. So having to learn to just work within that realm. So how did you end up in Alaska? Your dad. Oh, that's so my dad peaced out. We mm-hmm. were in Southern Mississippi. I'm for, sorry, by the way. I mean, thanks. it's hard. I know you've processed it, but it's, it so is, hard. it is, hard. it is hard. And then having the moments of, and also by the way, recovering from things and processing anything, it's such a, you don't like hit this point of peace and never go back. Right. It's like the windows of being upset or fucked up about it just get smaller. You're like, right. I still go crazy and like lose my mind about it, but it's just a shorter or different things come up at different times yeah. when you're not expecting it. I find that in relationships and it's why I just generally avoid them trigger a lot of the abandonment and yeah. all of that shit that I don't even want to look at. I'm no. like, I don't even want, this is, I don't have time for this shit. No. And it's like, I'm in a relationship now and it's like, that is a thing where you go like, well now I'm going to have a thing I'm worried about losing. Yeah. And now it's like, instead, like when I'm on my own, I'm cool. It's like, I'm, working i'm doing all my things taking care of me mm-hmm. balance you know working to try to balance my life and now it's a person comes along you're like i love you and now it's the countdown of how long until something i do makes you stop loving me mm-hmm. or like which the logical side of me goes like yeah my dad didn't leave because yeah of anything i it's did not personal but there's still that like subconscious of like but people will just leave yeah and people go that's not the norm and it's like Okay, but like for me to go into a relationship and like approach it as if that's not ever a possibility would actually be insane. And it's <laughs> it's also in your cells. When yeah. you, when you're little and that stuff like you said you might not remember it. I there are so many things that I don't remember but my body remembers yeah. that amazing. I think I talk about this book constantly. The body keeps the, the body score. The body keeps the score is it the saved best. my life. Oh, yeah, but also fucking I listened to that when I was on the road for three months, like a summer tour as an mm-hmm. audiobook. And boy, trying to drive and not sob to some of that shit. Yeah, yeah. No, but so. But it's in your body. Your body, the genes and the cells remember that. So it's, some of it is. It changes that's the you. the nature of trauma is that it does alter you. Yeah, and you don't. Yeah, because of the way like 
your body reacts. It's like, you're not always going to go or it takes years before you can go, oh, this happens because of this. Because there's still things that trigger me that I go, I'm now aware enough to go like, this is obviously attached to something. Yeah. Because this is not how I should react. Yeah. But I can't stop the reaction. Yeah. Like, I don't know why when my my roommate brings up that I'm like, uh, like if I, if something's messy, I have a fucking, that's what, that was all therapy today. It's like, I don't know what it is where it's like, I'm a little messy. I'm not gross, but like sometimes a little chaos on the desk area mm-hmm. type. Of, and when someone points it out, like I feel it in my body. That's like, what? what? Who beat me about a fucking dirty yeah. pot or something that I go like, like just like, mm, like that's so some crazy. sort of like crazy self, but self-worth. Like, what is this? Yeah. Now being at the point where I can at least go, okay what's happening what's that before it was just like yeah like a s- abused mm-hmm. dog mm-hmm. yeah now it's getting to the point of like well like how much can you especially that book i was like well how much can i truly recover you can't though i mean my therapist is like you can't you will never recover from this yeah and it's like she's like you'll only learn how to manage it you yeah. cannot that's the nature of ptsd that's the nature of trauma we've destroyed the word triggered in our society but for people who have actual triggers trauma it is a real thing there have been moments in my life when things have come up when i've had to you know put my feet on the ground start naming things that are like one cut because i get it's like i can smell things it's just weird no things set you off PTSD. Dude, I had a, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go, go. No, I literally had a thing where like, and there's, because it's like, you start to, when you start learning about PTSD and start going, okay, this is what this is, sometimes you can start to identify, you like, you'll know a trigger. You'll go like, actually, this will trigger me. Yeah. But then I have things where I'm like, what the fuck? I had a panic attack when I smelled green beans in a restaurant one time. Like, and I was with my boyfriend and I was like, we have to leave. Like, I'm like getting teary eyed thinking about that yeah. smell. And it's like, what is, I don't know. I still don't know. But like, yeah, I guess getting to the point where you realize because there's this like therapeutic culture of, or does this idea of like, let me fix it yeah. versus let me learn to accept it. Yeah. Yeah. Has been a huge going like, and I'm still on the fence of, being aware that there's like being aware that this is a thing that's always going to be there and you just have to learn to manage it. But I haven't fully do- dove into like, I still have my foot in the like, maybe, but maybe we can fix it. <laughs> maybe like, You're like if I was really therapy. good, I could fix it. Like if I did my, if I was diligent and like logically, I know that's not true. And I don't even want to go into the feelings of why. Like yeah. even today in therapy, we were taught, she's like, well, that's disassociation from like whatever your childhood. And I'm like, okay, well, how do we fix it? I literally said that. I'm like, all right, well, what do I do? And she's like, that's not that's who this, you are, how this works either, Bridget. Cause I want to, she's like, God, I want to know who your therapist she's is. She's amazing. That's great. I, I want to put things in a box and yeah. just, and I do this with people a lot. I'm yeah. like, it's creepy. The way that I left my ex-husband or this man that I was with two years ago who really loved me and I could not accept it. He, it, it, I could not accept it. And I'm very relatable. Yeah, just couldn't. But I, when I left, I just put it in a box and never looked back. Yeah. I never, and it's, I'm like, this is creepy. You know, it's yeah. like, why do I do this? Just going, That's that. I've moved on. Okay. And then- no, it's creepy though. She's like, well, you moved every year and a half. You had like people coming and going. You had Fuck. in and out, a lot of trauma, dad, going to see your dad and leaving, your dad being on the other side of the country, your stepdad leaving once a month basically and not we're Fuck. never knowing when he was coming back like that does things to you i'm like does it though like <laughs> yeah but like it's like, surely at this day and age like we have we're at the point of nearly having flying cars as a regular thing there must be something and i feel like you and i are so similar in, yeah, the, God. in the respect that we you do the exact same thing I do, which is casually brush over the most heavy shit. Horrendous. And We're- people are like, whoa, you know, I'll be like, oh yeah, when I was drugged and raped. And I've processed it to a certain extent, but other people, <laughs> it's like, why are you so cavalier about this? Yeah. That's like, how can you just, and then it's like, I don't want to take, I don't want to dismiss the pain. Well, that's been a, but that's a- being a comedian. Too. Well, yeah. And that's been an interesting thing about, starting to dive more into real shit and like how can I make a joke about this is having to learn that it's like oh yeah the whole audience wasn't left in a waffle house <laughs> like so, so you say that and some people are like oh my god what? Yeah. wait go back to that 
Like someone, the, I have it because I have a joke about it. And the other day in the audience, and I've been doing the joke forever. And but I say the sentence of like when I was eight, my dad abandoned me in a Waffle House, and a man just went, "That's not funny. That's so sad." Yeah, I've definitely had that reaction. <laughs> And then you're like, oh, no, am I just up here processing my trauma in front of these strangers? Yeah. When it's like, <laughs> like you need help. Well, and then the, <laughs> and then the fucking dumb part of like my comedian brain is sometimes when something's fresh, I'll go, I'll just I'll just work it out on stage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like every once in a while I am processing trauma, yeah. which sucks for the audience. Yeah. Although like it, if you're lucky, it'll you'll still find ways that it's funny when you're, it's brand new. But like. It then a, a does a lot of it has eventually turned into like really well crafted bits and it's not as like let me dump this huge sentence on you I find a way to like do 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 but yeah no because when you've been through so much it's not you're, you're just like yeah I I've dealt with it and I, it's how you survive I think for yeah. for me it was definitely absolutely the first time well the only rehab I was in they were like you use humor to mask all of your pain I'm like yeah of course <laughs> well and that's why i get indignant about a problem with this yeah about people don't joke about that don't joke about this uh -huh, it's like uh -huh. dude the fucking sophie turner sansa from game, game of, of thrones. thrones did like a thread or maybe it was just one post or a couple posts about how like you shouldn't joke about mental health issues oh come and on i went it. fucking i was quote tweeting i went nuts i was just like <laughs> i wish i'd let me tell you something i mean and then it ended up with a joke that like i haven't done on stage but i was like i should find a way to make that because i just was like this is so i was like lolol this is so fucking dismissive to people dealing with their because like when people go like you can't joke about rape yeah. I'm like, don't you tell me how to fucking cope yeah and then i just i tweeted i was like if you think joking about mental health isn't the hill I'm prepared to die on. You have no idea how willing I am to die. Like, <laughs> I, like absolutely. Like, you're not. Joke. Well, because it's like to go like, that's not phase. Like, sorry. You don't get to speak for me. Yeah. And it's like, also you haven't considered that the people joking about mental health, like you can't conceive that maybe they have a mental health struggle. Like yeah. you don't go like, you think that that's a fucking completely sane put together person. You who's think anyone on stage doing stand up comedy is completely sane. You are the dumbest person I've yeah. ever met. Anyone joking about <laughs> depression well that's why it's like when people go like just like oh fu like when people go like fuck you it's not a mental health problem which is like i do think we have a huge gun problem here yeah but you go like oh sorry you think a totally sane person shot up a mall yeah like yeah. it's like yeah no that's a bad person a hundred percent they yeah. should be in prison and there is a gun issue yeah you don't think that maybe like they had a problem yeah like you it's but which is so weird because it's like when it's when it's someone when it's my depression my bipolar like you know, embrace my mental health. And it's like, yeah, but you don't, you don't, you don't get to be like stand up for mental health and then like callously toss a person with antisocial personality disorder to the side. Yeah. yeah. It's either all or nothing. Yeah. Like, like you don't get to be like, you, I, you know, I stop the stigma of bipolar and then be like, okay, but like now we're all piling on in this schizophrenic man who said like a sexist comment to you at an open mic. Yeah. Like, yeah. like you, you guys, he's like clearly mentally unwell. Yeah. Which, still dangerous. Yes. It's good to be aware of that person for safety, but like we're all making fun of this yeah. person. Like that's okay. Mm. Just any, am I, I jump from A to Z very no, quickly. No, you're fine. Okay. I'll, I'll keep the thread. So when your mom just moved to Alaska for a job, she got a job. She's okay. always worked for the government. So she was like a secretary of a very high up, like commander on the base in Mississippi. And, and that's where your parents met. Um, no, my parents met I at a waffle house. God, probably in Florida. <laughs> my mom was probably drunk. They, they got married very quickly. Yeah. And my mom, I think wanted to check the box of being married and have kids. Yeah. Cause that's just her vision. And also I think, she was like, oh, if I marry a guy in the military, I get to travel. Yeah. We're going to see the world. Yeah. So they went from like Florida where they got married, which I very recently, because I had to dig up my birth certificate for something, a passport or some shit. I didn't notice this, but I looked at my, the full birth certificate and like my dad had been married to someone else a month before for like, he married my mom for like two days and it got oh, annulled. Wow. I knew he'd been married before, but I was like, cool, he has other wives. Like he had past things. And then I saw that and I was like, oh, this fucking checks out now with yeah, my mom's like yeah. instability and like manic like jump in so they moved to california and then my dad they actually got my dad's like not my biological father oh because in his words uh they tried to have kids for a while and he has uh kleinsfelter syndrome which is actually an extra chromosome but it's the extra sex chromosome which is a weird like so my dad's like internally a hermaphrodite is that what that means i don't know uh-huh but essentially one of the side effects is like shooting blanks. Okay. My friend David is convinced because they, 
so he's like, yeah, we went to a sperm bank. And my mom's like, yeah, we, you know, we went to a sperm bank. And we paid for artificial insemination, which I believe that they did. But my friend uh, David Taylor is also convinced. He's like, yeah, but your mom is also a borderline alcoholic. So <laughs> she probably fucked other people. <laughs> like you're probably just from some man. She like, it's a Jewish jockey she met in a bar in California. <laughs> because when I found that out, which I found out when I was 19, I wasn't supposed to find that out. I was like visiting my dad. He had been remarried for years. And my older stepbrother, who's like a fucking drunk, who I, sh- I shouldn't say alcoholic. Yeah. But like was living with them. And I made a joke about being like, I always felt like I was adopted or something. And he like made a face and was like, and I was like, wait, what, what's, what's that? And he's like, well, I, um, I, if I tell you, I have something I want to tell you, but if I tell you, can't tell your dad that I told you this. He had overheard my dad telling his mom like early in their marriage, like, oh, they're actually like artificially inseminated, which I didn't, at that moment, I just thought like, oh, he must have been sharing that information. And then the further away I get, the more I'm like, was he like, they're not really my kids. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, well, they're not really my, you know, yeah. so, which is a whole other thing. But like finding that out was like mind blowing. And yeah, then I, of course, crazy. was like, I'm gonna bring it up. Like, and then when I finally told my mom, I was like, hey, by the way, I know. And I think you should tell my brother because I don't want to have to tell him. She's like, I'm not telling him. And and then I was like, are we from the same? She insisted. She's like, you, you're you from the same sperm donor. Did you guys get? Oh, I did 23 and Me uh, years ago just because once I found that out, I was like, well, I, I'm not trying to like find my f- biological, right, biological right, father right. and be like, daddy, you know, yeah. but it's like. <laughs> I was sitting here worried about the health, like the history of health issues in my dad's family don't apply to me. Right, right. Like I was like, my grandma, like everyone has diabetes. You're like like writing things down on on a thing. And it's like, that doesn't, doctor. I'm like, that doesn't apply to me. Like, has there ever been skin cancer in your family? You're like, yes. And then it's like, nope, never, no skin cancer. No, it was like, literally I had a seizure my freshman year of college on my way to my first football game, like on a bus with everyone, like how embarrassing. But I was it was very bad heat exhaustion. But my dad was like, yeah, you know, your grandma and one of your cousins has epilepsy. And this was before I found out. <laughs> oh my God. And it's like, you fucking moron. But I mentioned that to him after I finally was like, hey, just so you know. And he's like, he's like, yeah, but it's like, you've been, I don't think about that. Yeah, yeah. Which I, I agree. I believe. I believe he doesn't, you know, consciously go, this is not my biological father or Until daughter every day, you know? Wife. Yeah. But it's like, but you know. But you, yeah. You would think with health stuff, that would be yeah, a like a priority. And so it's yeah. like, oh, no, I'm just super Jewish and I got too hot is what happened. Yeah. Because that's what I found out. I did 23 Me because I was like, well, I want to find out, is there a history of other shit or what? I, I lived my whole life being like, I'm German and Irish and that's uh, it. Because that's what my mom's like whole identity was. Like, we're German and Irish. And it's like, you're not even all those things. Like, you're actually like, you're your mom is like Dutch. Uh, but it's like, what's your weird pride around German and Irish? That's fucking. Yeah. But I just was like, that's who I am, which I was never someone. I maybe as a little kid when I found that out, I was like, thought it was cool. Interesting. But I was never someone who's like fucking. Yeah. Fucking Irish. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Although I do have a tattoo uh, above my pussy of a four leaf clover, but that's just a joke decision. <laughs> um, so maybe I am Irish, but <laughs> So I did Seems 23 like a very me. Irish decision. Yes. No, it's like, so there's something there. Like, that's what a fucking crazy Irish person would do. Yeah. And I found out I'm more like Ashkenazi Jewish than anything oh, else. Oh, wow. Yeah. But I thought, because I was the only one in my family who had done it. And I thought like, you know, I bet, I bet we're all Jewish. And like, that's just buried. Because mm. my, because my family has a very, like when they get together, like my aunts, my uncles, my mom, it's very, what I would think like a, like a movie version of like an Italian or a Jewish, just loud, funny, yeah. laughing when it's the whole big family. But I guess it's like, yeah, that's maybe just family. You know, yeah. like, I don't know if your family gets along or that's how they go. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. They're so, Irish Catholic. Yeah. My dad's that's, one of 10. So yeah, it's like, it is it's a very ca- Irish Catholic yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like my mom's one of eight and it's just like, yeah, you fucking, you make fun of each other and yeah. you're loud it's and a like, roast battle. yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. It's just, everyone's got a fucking nickname. Like yeah. remember the time that Kathy got yeah. so fucking shit faced, all these inside jokes. Yeah. It's like, we were talking, my cousin and I co-produces this. She did. She sat down to do her episode and we were talking about how, if you were like sensitive, it was just like chum in the water. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> you couldn't, you're you not going to survive. survive. Yeah. <laughs> like you have to get over yeah. it. Which is like, yeah, that it makes sense that I could, cause my mom for, as hard as our relationship was and as as low as the lows got, like she's fucking hilarious. Yeah, yeah. She like, sounds hilarious. Yeah. And my mom always goes like, you know, like I always thought it, if I was a, if I would have gotten into comedy, which it's like, yeah, fuck you now that I'm doing it. But yeah. also like, 
Yeah, she's probably not wrong. She's yeah. fucking because she's batshit and she's just like <laughs> off the. She doesn't give a fuck what you think about yeah. what she says. But like, yeah, last year, the twenty three and me sent an email. It's like you know, if you buy you know two kits, you get two for the price of one or whatever. So I wasn't just gonna buy them back. Take this, but I so I asked my mom and my brother. I'm like, hey, I did this. You you get to see your genetic history. It shows you family members and health. You know, would you guys be interested in that? I'll get it for you. And they're like, sure. Sure enough, my brother is my half brother, so we're not from the same sperm donor. Because oh. she had been, she'd be like, you know, you go from the same donor. And she's like, they must have lied to me, <laughs> which is a possible. I mean, that's when it was a new thing. Maybe they fucked up. I could see that being. But it also, seems sperm donor stuff seems um, pretty rigid. Well, and it seems very responsible. Like based on the the profile that you've given of of your mom it just seems very like a responsible thing to do yeah where it's like i believe like that- a, a kind of premeditated thoughtful thing that you would but maybe they had that time in their marriage where it was like well and i do think that she was like i'm married I, she said she she i think the how close, long were they married before they started having kids yeah mm, i'm trying to think maybe like a year and a half and then how long were they married oh how long are they married total uh like eight about years no, I guess it was like 15. So they were married oh, for a okay. little while before. Because okay. I was maybe like eight when my dad left and they started getting divorced. So my brother was about 10. Okay. And the, as she had a ton of miscarriages, which okay. I think some of those were how they realized he couldn't have kids. Uh, Fertility issues in general. But also, I don't believe okay. for a second that she wasn't drinking the entire time. Okay, okay. Which I try not to think about too much because I get so fucking pissed when I'm like, who could I have been if I wasn't fed Heineken <laughs> in the womb? <laughs> but like... <laughs> She wanted kids and she, the, I think the closest I'll ever get to my mom going, Hey, I'm sorry. Is her when I was like on the road, maybe, maybe 2016, I think it was my first summer solo touring on the road. Just, I booked a bunch of weekends back to back. I was headlining a few, you know, D clubs mm-hmm. featuring here doing one nighters, whatever, just stayed on the road, which I, I didn't know how much I felt like that. I liked alone time till I was on the road. Like I would just stay social. Like, yeah. I, cause I was afraid of my thoughts basically. Yeah. But like I had a long conversation with her once. I just like, she, I, I think I called her and I was just like, ah, on the road, maybe after listening to the fucking three audio books about trauma in your body. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I'll just call and I'll just, she, I'll call and just say hi. And we just had this long conversation. The closest I think I ever got to her. Cause I never was like, apologize. I'm never going to, you know? Yeah. Which she's in, so loudly in a 12 step program that I've always been like, but you've never like made amends, but so, so, oh, much, of, so much of a so part of your identity now? is, Oh, that's a whole, oh, she's a whole other podcast. sober, but yeah, no, the amount of times I've hung out with her, like visiting her in the last recent years that like, she's, I've just caught her drinking mm. is makes me go like, were you ever sober? Mm. Or maybe she was. And now she's just getting old and she's like, who gives a shit? Mm-hmm. Or she's just like, I'm away from my husband who's also sober, like when the uh, cat's away. The new husband. Yeah. yeah. And they've been together for now 20 years. Okay, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she met him in AA. And like, oh. I don't feel bad saying because my mom literally checks into AA meetings on Facebook. Okay. She wears like AA phrases. She's yeah. that person, yeah. you know, that like, this is my club. This is my sorority. <laughs> yeah. But like, shit. Oh, so we're having this conversation and we started talking about shit. And she just was like, I don't know why I wanted kids. She's like, I wanted him so bad. I mean, I went through so much to have you guys. And like, I wanted, I I just thought like, I should share my genes and I should, that's what you do. You become a mom. I wanted to do it all. And and she's like, she didn't say sorry. She's like, I wasn't good at being a mom. Mm. Her admitting that was her kind of going. Yeah. I think she's like, I didn't fucking, I sucked. Yeah. <laughs> I, I fucking, I just wanted the, I didn't want to be a mom. I just, I didn't want to mother. I just wanted right. to be a mom. Right. I wanted to be like, look, I did it. Yeah. Look what and I made. You're like, oh shit. Now I have these things Lies. I need to take care of. Yeah. Forever. Which is, I relate to because it's why I'm like, I don't know. If you want it. If I want kids because yeah. I don't, I don't, I, I know what not to do, but I was never shown what to do. That's all right though. I mean, I can tell you from looking at the way my siblings are as parents that, and they are fucking amazing that that knowledge of what not to do is almost better than the knowledge of what to do. Yeah. Because you like, I know how to, what the wrong thing yeah. is. So I'm not going to do that. Yeah. I think about that because I go back and forth with the, I've never had a yearning for children. Mm. I get the, every once in a while. And now it's like gotten a little worse with my age of yeah. like that, like 
the clock. Ooh, mm-hmm. baby. I don't, mm-hmm. It's not the fear of, I, I better do it, but it's like, I'll see a baby and yeah. go, okay, my body is like, that's what you're supposed to do, mm-hmm. is that you should skip. Like I, my periods have gotten worse and I literally think it's my ovaries just screaming at me for not getting mm-hmm. pregnant. They're like, why? Mm-hmm. But I don't know. I had like that conceptual idea of, like I'm dating someone now who like, I like they, he's like, yeah, no, like at some point in my life, I would like to be a father, I think. And it, like, and, and I'm like, oh, you know, well, I don't know. So <laughs> it'll just burn that bridge when we get there. But like, it, that's another, it's the same thing as like people like really loving their families. The like, I, I know a couple girls, I have friends that have kids and they're like, not great moms and yeah. it's like you just had a kid because that's what everyone around you was doing yeah. and i have friends that i'm like yo you were born to be a mother yeah but like that yearning like i have i know girls who are like i just i want i know I want so badly and and i have friends like that who, who want the husband they want that and some of them are like completely single and it's like makes me so sad yeah that i'm like you're yearning for this thing that's like at this point a little out of your control yeah but i but there's that part of me it's like why am i not so my baby but then that's like, the dissociation though i swear yeah. to god i get it and and i just but it's also the world around you right but that that's less and i mean yes and no there's a part of me that's like why would i want to do this and then there's a part of me uh, or bring a baby i'm like they were having kids in the black plague like this is yeah. honestly the best it's ever been for humanity yeah it's so like that, that's fine that's a that's null. just being too much in the news cycle and having a warped perception god help of how us. good we actually have it and yeah. how good things are for humanity you had to be like the world's on fire in erlewan yeah <laughs> like anyways i'll pay ten dollars for this <laughs> juice yeah exactly. you're like okay that's the weirdest thing about LA <laughs> is when they're like because I joke about the world burning a lot and there is that feeling I have Dan Carlin's new book actually sitting right around here somewhere <laughs> and it's it's the end is always near yeah. and it's like the human obsession with it always being the end yes and I think it just goes hand in hand with our ability to be aware of our mortality yeah like which sucks as an animal species I would yeah, it's like that's the the downfall of evolving to this point is that you're like yeah, but so- like all these people out there who are like, don't have kids, and I'm like, you guys, th- this is, there's never been more medicine. There's never yeah. been. Yes, we might be on the verge of unintentional environmental ecocide. You're like, yeah, okay, you're like, how about we euthanize some of the old people? Let's <laughs> like, if we're worried about population, let's get rid of a few grandmas. Saying, the olds need to go. Like, let's go. It's, it's elective suicide. <laughs> people are doing it. Switzerland's on top of it. So I want to know though when you got to Alaska. We're still trying to God. get to Alaska. Sorry. Okay. Um, so sixth grade, she got a job. And then went to Alaska and then you were there through. Through, yeah, through high school. And from the minute we got there, I was like, I got to get out of here as quickly as I can. Fuck yeah. That yeah. would be horrid. And what? And it is the light deal, right? Yeah, no, it's like two so, the, hours. The of- sun is always up in the summertime. And then, yeah, no, the wintertime where I live, it never gets, there are places it goes to like weeks of nighttime. Wow. But where I live, it gets down to, for a, for a few months, you're getting two and three hours of daylight. Wow. And that's like, sucks. That's Come, crazy. Especially like a little kid. It's like coming from Mississippi where like one time we had a snow day because there were flurries that weren't sticking to the ground. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you have sunshine. I lived on the Gulf Coast. There was a beach. Like before my dad left, it was like we had a boat Uh, and like we'd go out, you know, and it's like I loved the sunshine. And also a week into getting there, we found out that I break out into hives if I get too cold. Oh. So I was like, good. There are people who are allergic to the cold. Yeah, urticaria is what it's called. Yeah. I have an allergy to cold weather. Yeah. And my mom called it being a pussy. I think I have it too. Yeah, no, it's, (laughs) well, and I just, like, now, and now I'm like, I think I'm just Jewish. Like, that's my, because, like, I get too cold (laughs) and then as soon as I go to Florida for college within a week, I had a seizure at a football game because I'm like, (laughs) I'm too hot and it's like, my body just, honestly i'm just like my body wants to die because now yeah. i have an autoimmune disease and i'm like i'm just suicidal at a molecular level yeah. <laughs> it's like we're done here <laughs> yeah but like yeah it's just like i just need to be in 75 degrees not too humid not too dry yeah like cali that is literally like the factor of i was like well new york or california is where you got to go to be a comedian knowing nothing not being in the industry and realizing like if i knew what i know now it's like well if you want to just pure stand up maybe new york is a mm-hmm. better place to get around to get it because there's you can really like if you can get into the clubs there they you can make a living yeah where in la it's like you got to get on the road yeah um if you can get into the store 
and the factory and keep a low overhead. Yeah. You can make a living. Yeah. And that's such an insane. And I say that as someone who works there, like, yeah, that is such an insane goal to be like, well, well, if I just get passed at the most prestigious club in the world, I'll be fine. Yeah. It's like, yeah, okay, but what are you doing until then? Because that's that's a huge accomplishment that I have to like sometimes remind myself to go like, oh no, this is like a big deal. But it's like, yeah, that's so hard. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, so as far as getting by, that was the better option. But I was like, well... I know what happens if I get cold. Yeah. I'm gonna go to California makes sense for my body. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Is your stepsister super woke? Do you need a mug that reminds you of your favorite person on Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> go to BridgetFetacy.com <laughs> and use promo code WALKIN for all of <laughs> Fetacy's amazing merch. T-shirts, tote bags, mugs. Here's my testimonial. <laughs> I wear my fetasy hoodie every day, and that is not a lie. I love my fetasy champion hoodie. It's, it's true. So- she won't even take it off to wash it. No, I, I seriously have it in my car at all times. It's been so cold here in California. <laughs> California cold is no joke. I've been freezing my butt off in fetasy's... Fetacy Inc. has kept me warm, warming my hands by the dumpster fire on YouTube while I wear my Fetacy Inc. hoodie and beanie. So go to BridgetFetacy.com and use promo code WALKIN for 15% off your next Fetacy merch purchase. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most important deal of your lifetime. <laughs> Fetacy sponsoring WALKIN, what's welcome now? It's a closed loop. <laughs> it's a full fantasy loop. <laughs> and now back to your regularly scheduled programming. More fantasy content. This content has been produced by Fantasy Inc., which is sponsoring this content, which also is giving you a discount on our merch. <laughs> <laughs> and did you, when did you know, where did you go to college in Florida? University of South Florida. Oh, okay. Which I got, a, like, I had never even did heard you finish? of. you I did. Oh, nice. Which I deeply regret. But like, it's great. I have the piece of paper to go like, woo. What did you get a degree in? I finished with a degree just in mass comm with a focus in public relations. I was double majoring in that and mechanical engineering. And then I was like, okay, I don't actually, I want to do comedy. How did you know you wanted to do comedy? I, from the time I was like 17, I was like, at the, I was like, I want to be on SNL is what I thought. Uh. And like, I thought like my senior year, I was I was in all the clubs. I was like in student government. I was just very outgoing. I ran the student assemblies. I was voted class clown. Uh, I was just funny. Yeah. To me, I think it even was like, I love it. It was, I don't even know how much was a drive to be like, look at me, look at me versus like, I this is the thing I just think I'm pretty good at. Yeah. So I like, I, and I, I like to work hard and I think it's a thing where I'll be able to be okay. I think a little like, I don't think I thought that was at the forefront of my mind, but I think internally it was almost like, you know, it almost because it's a hard industry oh god but i was like i think i can make it work yeah i I have faith in my ability to do this i never was like i'll be the greatest of all time but i'm like i think it's in the realm of possibility that i could make Make a living living. yeah and and i love making people laugh so there is that like immediate validation that like maybe that's like child of an alcoholic youngest like Oh, you're happy. Yeah, yeah. And in in my mind, there is a little bit of like, it's very lame when you think about the fact that there are people who like literally save lives being like, it is a small service. I feel like I'm making people feel good and that feels nice. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, why why wouldn't I try to make money in a thing that like makes me feel good and the people who I'm performing for, they (laughs) feel good. That's fine. You know, it's not, I'm not saving kids with cancer. I always said this. I had a dog bite. That's why I have the scar. And um, my hand surgeon is a genius. And Uh, he literally goes to Africa and repairs children's clubbed hand. Like the work he does is insane. Yes. Amazing. He's a genius. He's like a hero. 
And I'm like, I tell jokes sometimes online and sometimes on stage. And he's like, no, it's important. I'm like, don't patronize me. It's don't. <laughs> like, you're literally in like Africa repairing children's hands. Yeah. It's <laughs> like if I want to like get on a high horse, I'm like, yeah, sometimes I think there's a deeper message in these jokes about my butthole. But it's like, no, I'm a clown. I'm a yeah, clown. I'm a clown. And it's fine. I enjoy it. I'm happy I get to do it. But it's like, let's relax. And I do every once in a while have that guilt of i was a real smart kid yeah and i was like if i had been in a family that gave me any sense of direction mm. encouraged anything mm. i did would i be in this field or mm. would i be it's like it's like i loved math as a kid like it was in i was a dork yeah i like did algebra for fun as like yeah. a third grader i had like books that i was like did algebra problems because yeah. i thoroughly enjoyed it and then i'm like and then I ended up with a degree in PR yeah. because I was like, I hit a point where I knew I wanted to pursue this because in college I was, I was a party animal and like, and I like joined a sorority because I was like, cool, fun. And then I was like the funny girl in the sorority. I wrote all our, they do a little fucking like vignette talent competition, oh. talent show, like yeah. variety show. So I would write those we'd win and like, just dumb stuff or like anytime I had to like I was the person who would present things because I was funny I just enjoyed it and so I hit a point where I was like well if I want to finish in four years because of where things were and like the workload because I was having to work a job so I could only do so many credits and like not blow my head off I would I could only I was like I can only finish in four years if I just do one major right so I was like mass comm is mindless is what I thought. I was like, I don't, I won't have to fucking think twice, but that's going to be easy. Yeah. Cause it came easy to me. Yeah. And I took for that for granted because in the program, there were people who were like, man, this is tough. And I was like, you are really going to struggle out there. This is, <laughs> life is going to be very hard for you. Cause I was like, yeah, we're like a press release. You're struggling with a press release. Yeah. I would just sleep through class. But like, that's be, just because that was one of the things I have that happened to be a thing that came easy to me, which everyone has different things or some yeah. people have, struggled with a lot of things i think when you when communication comes easily to you and any medium you take it for granted yes that some people have a very hard time socially and yes. interacting and communicating and it's which just something we take for granted we do and like i appreciate that now but then there is the cynical part of me that's like why the fuck are you getting a degree in public relations <laughs> that's what if i was you gonna have get a degree trouble in. communicating yeah yeah like to me i was like yeah no i can be the face of a company if I never fuck like I couldn't now not with my internet history yeah but it's like you you're intimidated by talking to the class yeah no this is not for you this is not the right field for you but so and I didn't realize it seemed like everything was so innate in the class but I actually didn't realize how much of the little things I was learning were going to help my career yeah like yeah knowing PR is very helpful for well especially since you do all your own booking all my own booking and it's mm -hmm. like okay so now i have to like promote myself or like mm -hmm. being able to sell myself to someone to book me mm -hmm. is like because i'm fucking self-promotion makes me feel like a piece of shit mm -hmm. but knowing like okay if you phrase it like this yeah and having to go like with comics or like when you give someone a bio to think, look i don't actually like think this of myself yeah <laughs> i don't think i'm like a phenomenon I or like, like i don't think i'm the fucking one of the great but it's like you fucking that's what people book you because they read that and they're like well i said it and then someone else said it so now i'm quoting them like, i had somebody write my bio because i cannot write yeah no things. i had to some i had to have and i think the but i i got stuck on um some what was it it was like Oh, I was writing a book proposal and I got stuck on the bio. It's like the second segment. And yeah. I was like, I can't get past this. I can't, no. I can't write it. And I then, had to have someone pepper, like add so, in the spice. Somebody wrote it for me and they're like, I was reading it last night. Makes me want to kill myself. Something like, I'm a digital pioneer and I'm like, I can't stop laughing. <laughs> what, what am I pioneering? <laughs> yes. Like, yeah, no, I had like, because I was like, here's my credits and I feel like you could. And then I had a friend from like from college who like I was like you know yeah. PR it up that's yeah. what I was like you know spice it up and she did and I was like if this was well okay <laughs> it's like I'm nobody yeah but being like if I had a bio it would literally just say verified nobody literally a hundred percent and it's yeah I'm just like a clown that like yeah. 
it aspires to be enlightened. Yeah. That it's like, I'm a Buddha that talks about calm is my goal. Yeah. And I'm neither. You're like a funny I'm, philosopher. Yeah. And it's like, I'm just a woman who talks about calm and I hope for the best. But like, <laughs> yeah. And it's because of that bio once I did a weekend somewhere at Dayton, Ohio. And I show up and the marquee says, international superstar. <laughs> and of course I took a picture because I'm like, that's fun. But also like, <laughs> no. Like I international superstar who you've never heard. of. Yeah. It's like, oh, I did one show in Switzerland <laughs> and now I'm an international superstar. And also like last summer, 2018, I did a tour in Europe. I did like nine cities sold out. But most of that was just because expats were like, oh, American entertainment, the yeah, English yeah. Eat entertain like I know that yeah. there were. I was pleasantly surprised at the like little small handful of people who came and they they'd heard, they oh, I heard you on a podcast. I started following you. Yeah. Which was so fucking cool. And I still can't accept it. I'm like me yeah and then you're like oh god i hope was i okay <laughs> yeah but it's like yeah no i sold out but i'm not i wasn't like i all my all my fans filled this theater <laughs> they were like chanting my name and then encore no it was just people who were like oh thank god something that i don't have to struggle to understand yeah yeah it's like no humor they can relate to yeah but yeah four years and then i worked one year out of college i worked like three jobs just hoarding money and then just came here. Drove out and hit the ground ah. running. Yeah. And it was. So you were like 23? Uh, yeah, 23, 22, 22, because I started college at 17. Okay. Uh, or I had just turned 18. I was just, I had a late birthday. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, 22, and then just, just the grinding, the, you know, open mics. And I just approached it with the same workaholism I still approach life with. It was like, mm -hmm. You know, as people go, oh, I, you know, I try to get up once a night. I'm like, yeah, I try to get up like three or four times a night. Mm -hmm. When people are like, how many, how many open mics do you do a week? Because people are like, you know, if I, if I get up seven a week, I'm doing good. And when I start, which is good. Yeah. That's great. That's great. If you do three a week, it's like fucking you're staying active. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like working out. Like, yeah. I wish I could have this compulsion with working with out. Yeah. But it's like, no, I got to fucking, if I, I got to get up like at least twice a night. Yeah. And then, and then I'd go hang out at the store. And that's how I got on the radar of the store, by the way. Yeah. I didn't go, I need to hang out. Well, a little was like, I need to hang out, but at a certain point it was like, I do the mics and then I was like, I have too much adrenaline and if I go home, I might try to hang myself. You started at the perfect age too. I yeah. started so old. I wrote about this just like how I'm like, what idiot starts doing stand up at like 30 years old? You know what though? I think it's great when I'm because really having a crisis of identity and conscious and my, you know, like what yeah. am I doing? But also because Nicole started somewhat late to our, my friend, Nicole Amy Schreiber. And it's like, I get the, like, you're young. You don't have, you, there's this gusto. You don't have anything yeah. to lose. There's nothing. But then I also understand that it's like, yeah, at 30, you actually have lived a life and you yeah. have stuff to talk about where it's like, yeah, yeah, of course I have a bunch of jokes about my pussy. Yeah. Like what but, else am I going to talk about? The fucking drinking. Yeah. But I feel like at 23, you probably had a lot more than most 23 year olds. That's true. So you, it, you'd lived quite a life even at 23. But I mean, even like our friend Becky Robinson, when yeah. she came out, she, I was like, I just envied her just fearlessness. I'm Energy. Like, this is someone who has not been slapped what is um some who says this? Oh yeah, she. You have never been told no. That you have or not you been knocked been down. Like slapped. Who has this joke? Is I think Jen somebody where they say you haven't been slapped by the dick of life in the yeah. face. Yeah, you just still have that fresh, bushy eyed. Like, and I had, but I think I was just like, I'm gonna go for it. And I do notice now, even in aging, the difference in my like, I don't even want to call it insecurity, just like unsureness about putting myself out there mm. where when I first started, it was like, come to my show. I'm doing this. I sent the booker of a, the tonight show a tape when I was six months in. Wow. And, <laughs> and now I just like, I, I'm like, keep putting off giving tapes to people who ask for them. And I'm like, ah, well, I, I could get a better one. And yeah, maybe there's some self-sabotage tied into that. But I was just like, this is good enough. I was but like, it's tough because not to interrupt. It's tough oh, because no, you please. only have one shot yeah. a lot of the time with these kinds of things. Yeah. It's like oh, see one tape of you and you're like, OK, I've seen that girl. Yeah. And then they're like, no, I get it. Yeah. And then especially with like a five minute set. Yeah. So I understand that. And then people write you off as the one thing you joked about. Yeah. Like that's like, I can't send you a joke about my butthole. And then you just go, like, oh, that's the girl that talks about her butthole. Yeah. But then it's like, if I send you a set about depression, you're gonna be like, that's the mental health comedian. And I'm like, yeah, I would like to talk about the things I struggle with, but I don't want to be the depressed girl. 
And I saw, and we don't even know. It's funny. My friend was telling her manager about me one time and his assistant was listening in because they listen in on every call. People who don't know this and the world out there listening, assistants run this fucking town. They're on every call. They're taking all the notes because that guy's not going to fucking remember anything. They have their own chat boards and community. They tell each other everything. Jesus. There is no secret in this town at all. It is Cannot crazy. even imagine what is being said on those chat boards. Oh, it's amazing. About everyone we know. <laughs> it is amazing. I mean, they know, they run the show around here. You for know real. what? That's so funny because... The, the, never mind you finish oh i was gonna say something so unrelated. so her assistant interrupted and he was like oh she's not funny i saw her once at um i saw her once it was like some shit ass show i did oh. yeah it they, was in it was at flappers in the um you you room but it was the entire audience for that for some reason that night it was almost like an asian bus tour Dropped, oh god like decided to go to and the, they just weren't and they didn't and i was doing stuff about depression and alcoholism and they just were not it was like not really we weren't connecting yeah and all. they write you off they're like no i'll never and this one assistant who happened to be in the room at that show is like oh i saw her once she's not funny i'm like how can you trust anyone about comedy yeah i would love to catch you slipping up on an email and be like i saw them assist once and they're bad at their job but you i would never trust anyone about their opinion about a comedian if they saw them once yeah and it's also like how in the industry do you not know that at this point How 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 like do you have the audacity to think you're a good manager and then Take the opinion of someone who call, and saw someone And by once. the way, that just means I saw her once. I started following her. I hate her. And she's not, And now You're I'm like, going to tell you she's This one funny. time. Yeah, God. I had, I had someone who I'd been emailing back and forth with who had seen me have a good set. And it, like he's like, yeah, keep emailing. I'll come to a show. I came back from like a 14-hour flight from Korea and had a show, which I hadn't told him about. And I was like, why did I take this show? I went straight from the airport, did the show, bombed. I was doing bits about depression that were new. It was a shitty crowd. Whatever. Went home, tired, slept. Woke up the next day. Hey, so-and-so, here's my spots. He's like, oh, actually, I was in the back of the room at the show last night. And I saw you. Um, anyway, keep getting up. Uh, and I was like, I wanted to be like, fuck you. But I yeah. was just like, well, goodbye, you. Um, That's so hard. But it's just, it's so fucking stupid. This whole industry is... Like, and I'm like, why? I go through ups and downs of worrying about it. And the more I'm in LA, the more I get caught up in the, oh, I should, I should want that. There's things like, I don't care about that. I think I should care about. Mm. (laughs) This is the theme of our podcast. Oh, I mean, no, (laughs) it's like, yeah, no, like if I got a late night set that was a set that I like and I get to perform it on TV, awesome. I don't want a late night set so bad that I'm going to carve out the set that I want and be like, well, here's the clean material clean enough that I've tweaked. Mm. that I'm okay with like if I don't love it I don't care and I also just should care more but I'm like yeah I didn't I just like live comedy yeah (laughs) like I don't know when it happens it'll happen if it happens yeah but here you go like oh I gotta I should want the sitcom why don't I the amount of people going like why don't I have that and the worst is other comedians going why haven't you done this when other comedians do it I think it affects me more why aren't you doing Montreal? Mm. Why is that girl there and you're not there? Yeah, and it's like, you're like, I'm sorry, not- do you like, do you not understand how this works? You're in this industry. But also I'm not, I'm keeping my eye on my own paper. Why are you keeping tabs on, on me? me and my competitor? Like people are perceived competitors or whatever in this yeah event. like when people put that do people do that to you where they're like well she don't, don't you get upset that she has this and you're and it's like the what? thing no. people always say to me is um the one thing i hear all the time is why haven't you been on rogan yet i'm like he knows we're friends yeah and they're like i'm not gonna i don't i don't feel like i should yeah they'll be like how come this guy who just got i'm like yeah don't put this shit in my head yeah because then it's then you start going why well why not me and then it's like (laughs) yeah i don't have a self-worth issue around my comedy until people start going how come that girl and i just with those opportunities in my life being uh, uh, having things unfold the way they've unfolded i truly have that hippie trust that everything is unfolding as it should absolutely and i've gotten to a point where for the most part i stay in that area and the more i've like meditated and just worked on me and stuff the better I am at that. And I can't leave that area. Yeah, no, good for you. Because like, 
I will, but I can't. I have to do what I... It's like this little small circle of focus on the work. You know, yes. I can control the work. What I can control, yeah, is like what I'm writing. I can control what I'm I putting out there. I can control my attitude. I truly believe there's room for us all. Yes. I've never had that like, oh, that fucking bitch. Yeah, that, that it's that like, oh, getting. only one woman can be. Yeah. I never. I li- I've always tried to support and give platforms to female comedians. Absolutely. I love and respect. I have, Same. I want to see everybody succeed. I feel like when they do, they lift people up, other people up. Yes. It just gives more opportunities for everyone when we succeed. Yes. So I don't have that, but there, are, there definitely are those like petty moments. Yeah. And they're usually moments that are implanted by yeah, like spurred someone by else. someone else. Being like, why haven't you done that yet? You're like, I don't know, because I really haven't thought about it. I feel like if it's there are it's one thing to have goals, but it's another thing to chase opportunity that you know, like, like you can't control. Yeah. And it's like that's when it gets in my head because people will be like, well, I'm mad about it. So you should definitely. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I'm mad. I don't have it. And you're further along. And it's like, I, I don't. Yeah. Why are you doing this? Thing. It's like, I didn't care about it. And now I'm going to be like. But it's almost like a nag. Yes. It's almost like a, why haven't, it's, it almost puts that in your head. Yeah. Like, why haven't you done that yet? Like, but at the same time, reminding you that you haven't done it yet. And yeah. It's a weird, it's a weird, like, it's definitely part. I really try very, very, I can control my attitude. I can control the work. I, I will get focused on results as it is that aren't even in relation to anyone else. I'm yeah. competing always with myself. Yes. That it's like, I, yeah, no, it's like, I'm already constantly being, I could do better. I could be putting in more time on this. And I that, can't you know. look at numbers. I've told every person I've written for every podcast, like I don't want to know analytics because I'm an addict and I will become obsessed with that. Yes. I will become obsessed with my every Patreon gives me anxiety because yes. every t- the numbers fluctuate, which is totally so normal. It's like, yeah, no, people and it's like a lot it's for me, it's mostly people being like, I gotta take a break for a little while because of finances. Right. But and then you go, I, Oh God, what have I done? Why yeah. don't they love me anymore? Or I feel because I'm it's weird when you're your own brand. Yes. You're like everyone's like, don't take it personally, but it's like You're like, but, but it's me. It and it probably isn't. It's probably finances or whatever. But I can't I can't look at the I, it's very hard. It's challenging. No. Nope. It's it's very challenging to just stay in your lane, focus on the work. Eyes on your own paper. Eyes on your own paper. Yes. And be supportive. But there there are so many there's so much noise. Yeah, so many outside voices. And it's like, I can't, I can't worry about it. No. And then, and, then, and I'm not happy when I do. No, it doesn't make me feel better uh-uh. because it just becomes this thing of like, it, now I'm going like, yeah, why didn't I get invited to that party I wouldn't have gone well, to? Well, because then now you're, yeah, it's a feeling of lack or wanting or being like the world doesn't owe me shit. Yeah. And that is generally the place that I come from. And the minute that I'm in that place of like, well, why haven't I? I'm like, I'm not entitled to be on anyone's yeah, show. It's like, hey, nobody deserves anything. Yeah. Like at all. Yeah. It's There's fucking- no reason for me to be. I'm so shocked and grateful when anyone gives me airtime or shares me with their audience yes that has a bigger platform yeah it's like thank you all you can do is be grateful and it's like i don't no part of me is like i should have I my own should have my own special by now dude and, and then you hear people saying that and it's like i don't know is that is that how you make it or like are you a crazy person the amount of people that be like i am a star and it's like what yeah but I don't want the the whole thing of fame has always seen like a byproduct of success. Yeah. So because Which is the, to me, it seems like an unfortunate an byproduct. An unfortunate one. Yeah. It's, it's not something that. Um, it's a catch 22. I don't want it. Yeah. Everyone's like, you want to be famous. I'm like, I know that if I'm going to be successful in the entertainment industry. It means you will be famous. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, but I just want to write entertain entertain. i want to like share my thoughts i want to like make my jokes yep i don't want a mob of people who are like 
And luckily we're, you know, I don't think with comedy you ever really get that. Maybe like Chappelle, but. It's I very rare to break to, to that like threshold. To that larger than life where you can't, I mean, even. And I'm thankful for it. Yeah. Even the, even Whitney and the biggest female comedians, they're, they're famous, but it's not like we're never going to be like Rihanna or Brad Pitt. Like level I can't even go down the street. Where they can't go anywhere. Yeah. They're a prisoner. So we don't need to worry about that. <laughs> yeah, there's like no day. That's the thing is it like not that I'm in any danger. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, I guess, and there is a difference between people who, I guess you, you see it in Hollywood because people come out here who, you know, there are people who want to entertain and they're pursuing that dream. And then there, you, and I think more and more in the digital age, there are people who are like, I want to be famous. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, what? You Like, how? And they're like, I just trying to be famous. Well, because like, you can be now. Yeah, and I'm like, oh. You can be the Kardashians Good luck. and make billions of dollars just being famous. It's like, I know it must be, it would be so nice to have billions of dollars and live in a place of comfort like that. But like, I don't, I don't, I, I don't dream of that at all. I don't, yeah. I'd, like, I don't envy that I life. was. I joke about that all the time because I'm like, I want to be a mogul. And everyone's like, why? And, and then Maggie, my cousin, and I were talking about um, how I'm always like, I want a private jet. And she's and I'm like, I don't even know where I'm going with this jet, you're, by the way. Like, like, I'm not going to leave my what mansion. What am I doing with this jet just flying around in circles? I just like, want to have it. Have, and That's so I funny. was thinking that, but really it is like when my roommate and Maggie and I are making the weekly dumpster fire in our undisclosed location and we have Friday night and it's our little writer's room and I love that I do this podcast here and you know <laughs> when Jim Gaffigan came to do it that's amazing and he showed up and he's like oh wow you're like a grown-up I thought this was gonna be like a studio apartment I was like, that's so funny hey fair enough and b that's, thank you for coming you're amazing that's you, awesome you thought that you. And you still came yeah. that's fucking great <laughs> That's so funny too. One, it's because like you don't know in the entertainment industry, especially with comedy, is it like how well someone's actually doing versus the perception, right? Or just how well they are managing their life with comedians. It's like there's probably some people who live far below their means and then get a little and start doing the opposite, or like vice versa. Because yeah. like I had to force myself to move into a nicer living situation. Because I had like a scarcity mindset. And so yeah. I was continuing to live in like, not, I wasn't even in a bad place, but it was just like, I don't need to be in a big house yeah. because the rent's so low and it's so far out of the way of everything. Yeah. But it was just like, well, what if it all falls apart? I know. I know that. It's like, oh, I can get a home that I'm not embarrassed to bring people to. The scarcity mindset is real. I do. I sometimes will. I didn't invoice this place that I wrote for for a year almost, nine months because I didn't need to. And yeah. everyone's like, just send the fucking invoice, Bridget. And I was like, no, but then I know I have $1,200. They were like, wow, how poor that's, have you been? I'm yeah. like, that's how poor I've been that it's basically a savings for me. Yeah, that like, it's like, no, no. Someone owes me money and I know that when I need it, I can collect it. That's so funny because you crazy. just made me remember that I have a Canadian check from a <laughs> that I've put to the side. Yeah. Like, oh, I should probably go... And even like I drove out to my credit union because I have a credit union. It's in Pasadena, but I'm like, fuck big banks or whatever. Yeah. But like, and they were like, hey, do you have another bank? Do you have like, or a friend you could sign this over to? Because with a big bank, it's going to be easy. There won't be fees. But with us, it's going to take like three months. Yeah. There'll probably be like a 60 to $90 fee. Whoa. So then I was like, I have to ask my roommate, which isn't a problem because I was, but I was like, I'm not losing that 60 to $90. Yeah. But now I feel like I'm like, how long can I, I don't need it right now. I know it's crazy. I mean, I I basically scraped by from seven last February was the first time I knew how I was going to pay that month's bills and the following month's bills. They're like, wow, I'm in my life since I was 17. Fuck. That's crazy. I mean, I was 40. Yeah. You know I mean? like, and it's that's like, a long time to be under that uh, kind like of afraid. Yeah. And it's like, I think I'm in a place now where, it, you know, it's, I'm not balling up, but like, I'm, I'm okay. And that's why I forced myself to move somewhere where I was like, yeah, nicer. It's like, I deserved that, but also like a little higher rent to be like, you're, you can do this. But like, really accepting that you're okay is like hard when you've grown up or like lived in that yeah. month to month. Like, how am I going to survive? We were talking about my therapist and I were talking about this today that 
Um, have you seen What the Bleep Do We Know? That movie that's like all about the power of the, the mm. mind and all. Of no, the I, I've been meaning to forever, but that's the story of my life. But no, there's a scene where they're talking about how you have to be able to know what something is in order to even see it a lot of the times and how when the ships were coming, I don't even know if this is real or not, but when the <laughs> ships were coming, this little anecdote in the movie and there were the na- indigenous people they had to have a shaman describe to them. The shaman looked every day and didn't. There, there was no concept of, of ships. ships, so he had to look every day, and then he had to tell the the people about it so that they could even conceive, conceive of it. Conceive of see it. it. And I was like, that's how I feel about success. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> my whole life has just been in fight or flight and reaction. Yes. And stress and struggling and just scraping by. And now that I'm... Can you know, breathe? My, yeah. My therapist is like, okay, we're going to try and get you from surviving to thriving, which I'm like, what? That's so great. What is that? You're like, what is this Thriving. Word? Yeah. I've been in survival mode basically basically forever ever yeah and so now that i am making ends meet and thriving a little bit it's so i'm like it's so uncomfortable it's hard to flip that switch because you're like it's gonna fall apart yeah it's gonna gonna fall apart and it's like what what do i yeah yeah how do i not self-sabotage either how do i not go back to what i'm used to which is like chaos disorder failure it's like am i gonna go on a spending spree or like (laughs) God, and like that's why I've been doing ninety meetings in ninety days because I've been so squirrely lately. Oh, good I'm like, for you! I recognize it doesn't matter for me as an alcoholic that I drink when I'm uncomfortable, whether that's because I'm success succeeding or whether I'm failing. No. it doesn't matter. It's food for me. It's yeah. like the yeah when people go like I eat my feelings and I'm like yeah, but like I also eat the good feelings. Yeah, like it's like yeah no I go. Like it doesn't matter. It's I'm it's, it's discomfort. You're like I'm overwhelmed, mm-hmm. and so I need. It's literally. It's at least I'm at a point where I go. It still hasn't stopped it fully. I I've gotten a lot healthier, but I go. I'm consciously going. Oh, I, I know this is bad for me, but like I need to suppress this because I cannot get through my day. <laughs> yeah, with this amount of whatever's happening. Mm-hmm. So I'll be like, and I mean. Food addiction is real and it's a huge problem, but it sounds so petty. Like my brother, like I make a joke about it because my brother genuinely like nearly died overdosing and I'm like, and now nobody will take my food addiction seriously. <laughs> but it's being like, because I have an autoimmune disease, so food really fucks up with my inflammation and stuff now. But I'll be like, I just, if I don't have a donut right now, I just feel like, <laughs> like I, I'm just, I know it's not the solution and I should be dealing with this healthier, but right now I just don't have the time to, which is just an excuse. But yeah. like, yeah, no, it's, I didn't realize that I do that until I started really examining. But yeah, no, the what should be a good feeling is like scary. Yeah, terrifying. And even in like love, love, you know, in a relationship (laughs) now, it's like I I'm I'm dating someone and it's relatively new. We started dating like five months ago. It's been like we're I guess officially a couple for two, which is so dorky. But like, yeah, I get so happy and then I'm like, ah, my brain's like, run. Yeah, she. Jump, should you just jump out this window for some reason? <laughs> Sometimes I get like really self-aware when I'm super, I, this is my sister and I did a podcast too. And whenever I connect to somebody this deeply and like the trauma and pain, <laughs> I think of what it must be like to listen if you're a healthy person and you're, are, are people just like these poor fucked up girls? Yeah, they sound <laughs> nuts. Cause I'll be like looking at my boyfriend sometimes and then I'm just like, what? <laughs> and he's like, I think that like, Half of our relationship is just one of us going, what? <laughs> like, huh? Because he, he's like such a good guy. And I've fucked up good, like good guys before. Mm. And, and like fucked up the relationship, but also probably fucked them up mm. by being like out of nowhere. Like, I can't do this anymore. Is <laughs> I a runner? Yeah. Oh, I'm a like, I'm a I, too. I take flight. It's yep. like there's fight and there's flight. And I have been flighting for so long mm-hmm. and and for a, for years, I convinced myself, oh, it's just not good. Or like, what is this? Feel? But it's, no, what was happening is I was being overwhelmed by anxiety because I was like, they're going to leave. This is going to yeah. fall apart. They're going to realize who I truly am because I felt like I was putting the best foot forward and you can't keep that up forever. I'll abandon you before you abandon me. Yeah. It's like, oh, you're not fucking winning. <laughs> and then you inadvertently become the thing you're afraid of. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, I just did you what I mm-hmm. think is the worst thing, the yeah. absolute worst thing that could ever happen. <laughs> I am so relating to all of this. God, and now dating a guy, he's like in, 
he's from a healthy family. Yeah. Healthy. That's hard. They've done well. There is, his <laughs> parents are still together. It's like 50 years yeah. of like. Being it's good like, for us though. Absolutely. And he's so, he's as empathetic as he can be without. And he's been, he's like, you know, he's like, I love you. And I'll never, <laughs> I will never truly understand what it's like to have that fear. But he's like, but you don't have to worry about me judging you. Yeah. For being worried or overwhelmed. He's like, I, we support each other. It's like very sweet. Yeah. And like, I am like, he really loves me. But then there's that part of my brain that's like, until he doesn't, you know, that's like, ah, like, what do you do with love? You're yeah. just like, ah, no, no, this is a fucking. My therapist is like, you're just going to need to find a guy, you know, who just keeps showing up even when, when you're freaking out and wanting to run and like doing your little, I was like, that sounds horrible. For yeah. Me. And then I'm going to be like, <laughs> have some self-worth. Leave me. <laughs> like, like this sounds like I mean, who's gonna do that what self-respecting yeah. man is gonna be like i'm just gonna love you into wellness and she's like bridget that's what it does I'm exist but then like, it's like is it i mean how many how many walls and hoops am i gonna put you through and how, like i was like how broken am i <laughs> that's like it, and then it's like do you find that and then even going okay thinking that i found it and going like okay he seems like he's willing to just be okay with needing to like, he knows there's going to be times I need a little extra love. <laughs> but, but then it's like, surely that's going to get, it. he's going to get exhausted by that mm. eventually. Like there's that like, yeah, you do that for, but I do that with just friends is that, and that's when I think I do like a turn where I like almost subconsciously push people away or stop hanging out with people. But, but it's because I'm like, they're going to be worn out on me being mm. me. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. just like, I'm just a lot. And yeah. it's, and then I wonder too, what am I bringing to the relationship? And I'm like, do I know how to love? <laughs> you know? Like, yeah, no, you, it's like, am I doing this right? Am I? Because it's so just, when you come from backgrounds, we it sounds like we have very similar, many things in common. <laughs> um, it's, as my therapist explained it, you're dysreg, she's like, you know, normally. Dysregulation. Yeah, she's like, normally when you have, stable parents who give you boundaries and teach you they love you unconditionally you grow like a tree with a straight trunk and then you can expand and this she's is fascinating like, and when you don't have that you're just reacting and you're dysregulated and so it's crooked and it grows in different directions and like it's a weird thing in a cage and, and like yeah. <laughs> and she's like it's so it's so it's all just dysregulated i'm like yeah but and again, back to like, I'm like, but how do we fix this? And it's like, yeah, no, trying to get to the place. Of, and it's like, no, you don't. You just learn that that's who you are and you learn how to maneuver uh, within that. But you're, but that, but then you like trying to accept that. You're like, no, but this sucks. Yeah. Because even my therapist now, it's like, I don't want to be some head case some guy needs to put up with and yeah. love back in like a fucking rescue dog. Yeah. And but then I, but then I go like, rescue. but he also has a rescue dog. <laughs> Which like he got a month before we started dating. So I'm like, I think maybe he's just at a point in his life where he wants to rescue things. <laughs> yeah, going like. I, we are rescue dogs. We are rescue. Yeah, and I literally am like, I'm a rescue. You have to be willing to give me, to go like, it's, you know, that's just how she is. It, my therapist reminds me, it took me two years to bond with my dog. Two years. I, you had the dog and you're just like, Ugh. I could not. I was, I was always like, maybe I'll give her back. I mean, we had a lot of dogs growing up. My parents would always give them away, yeah. which is fucked up. But I could not let myself get close. Just connect. Yeah. Cause I was like, she's going to die. I just, I just that's, couldn't. Oh uh, yeah. I'm fostering right now. Yeah. I cause couldn't. that's, cause I'm like, well, I, I like dogs. Mm -hmm. Dipping the toe in. Yeah. But and it's like, I don't, I realistically like because I have been fostering literally for only three days. This is a fucking perfect dog, mm. and she loves me. But I'm like, I don't even have the. I'm fostering. I don't have the schedule for. I can't. What am I gonna do? I'm going out of town for like two weeks in November. I can't keep you. And there's a lot of interest in her. And now I'm like, can't your boyfriend help? He goes on the road too. Uh, like I help him sometimes. Yeah. And there is a balance. Like I'm sure he'd help me. And he's like, we can help each other. And you have friends. And it's like. And I fostered to go, I did it going like, I'm just going to foster. Yeah. That's a way to help dogs. I'll get the fulfillment. And then I won't have to worry about later being like, oh, I don't know if I can keep caring yeah, for this yeah, dog. Yeah. It's like, I, I did my thing. I'll help it find a good home. Yeah. Which is a good thing to do. But I'm like, oh, but I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I love you. But then it is a thing. It's like, okay, yeah, for a week. And then am I going to be like, ugh. Yeah. What a, 
Might've called been. burden. I don't like using the word burden because it's too honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, it's a commitment. Yeah. Where I go, eventually, am I going to be like, oh God. It's so crazy. I worry about becoming like you know, my mother with the dog and being like, oh my, can't you just feed yourself? And yeah, it's like, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, it's so, yo, learning to work within how your emotions go and hoping that not only that you'll find someone to put up with that, but that you'll allow yourself to accept that is the next, that you'll let someone love you that much is I like, oh man, fucking. Today, I feel like I've been at this first. I, I'm so happy when I'm just in my workaholicism. Yeah, which is like, because I'm the same I don't. Way. And she's like, yeah, of course you are, because you don't have to face any of your feelings. You're just in your head thinking, how am I going to make this next thing? How am I? And I'm like, but I'm using my creative brain. She's like, yeah, but you're not in your heart or your body at all. You're like, but do I have to be? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, and, and then when I do, it gets so messy and they take me away from my work and then I resent them. So, yes, because it's like, I'm God. like, I don't have time for this shit. It's like th- doing anything that's like anything that's good for me. I'm like such a workaholic that I go like, I'll fucking throw self care to the side with like fucking exercise and like what like I just won't eat and then I'll just yeah. eat something shitty that I can grab out of like I gotta keep writing mm-hmm. and then having that balance with a relationship of being like, yeah, he stays the night when he's in town or I stay the night with him. And then it's like well, I don't have to be anywhere in the morning. So now I've started like. Well, they won't set an alarm. And I'm like, well, how long till... Because uh, I'm like, oh, if I had that one extra hour, I have an impossible to finish to-do list. It will never be done because right. I keep adding things. I keep neurotically going over it instead of doing it. But then I, but then I'll, at the end of the day, go, well, if I had woken up at 8 a.m., yeah, maybe everything, you know, I would be better. I had a mentor once say, you'll die with your inbox full. And that really stuck with me. Fuck. It was like, you're never... You're going to die with a long to-do list. Just you're, accept it. Yeah, just accept that... That's where I'm still at the, I'm still needing to get to full acceptance. I go in and out now, but just going, even with all that stuff. You should with, come here in parallel work in Pomodoro with me because this is the new thing I'm trying. I would do that. Okay. Yeah. I need somebody to, I am like much more functioning when I have partners to be like, get to work, you know? Like, no, it's, uh, the, I stay, that's so funny because I've always tried to be like, do you want to just like write? Not together. Work. Yeah, no. Like, but just like at the same it's that like, oh, they're working. I don't want to be the one that's slacking off. Yeah. Like, and just keeping each other accountable. accountable. Yeah. Yes. And my cousin introduced me to this Pomodoro method. I think I've talked about it on here. And it's basically 25 minute segments of focused work. And you have to focus on whatever the task is that you've decided. There's a whole thing. There's 25 minutes. Lean in. And then you take a five minute break and like do push ups or walk or you move. That's great. Laundry, whatever. Get a thing done. Yeah, a little thing. A little task and then sit down and do another one. But the thing that I found and what my cousin and I were talking about is it gives you a really good perspective of how many Pomodoros something takes. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, I, I know how much time something actually takes when I'm only focusing on that thing because I'm, I work from home and I, a lot of plates are spinning. And yesterday, my friend was over while I was like... Man, booking you and doing this other thing and then doing that other thing and then an email came in and I I answered yeah. that instead of being like okay I'm gonna focus on emails for 25 minutes. That's so I I've like tried to inst- figure out a, a way to instill that because yeah when you when you're spinning so many plates it's easy to get and I am ADHD and oh so yeah like what am I really I'm not really getting anything fully done no I'm he just constantly putting out like, fires how are you even getting anything done <laughs> yeah no that's like that's like the problem with my <laughs> podcast too is that like I don't dedicate enough time to booking and then all of a sudden I'm like I need a person of this identity what can I and then it's just putting out little like if what feels like fires but yeah no if you just, if like I just did like inflicted. if it's like okay right now is just sending booking emails yeah exactly it's it's life changing oh but shit come over. yeah I'm here all day that's, alone that's been my thing too is trying to find a way to because it's like I'm not at a place where I can like really want to afford to like have in office space yeah but having some situation where I feel like I have to clock in yeah where it's like that always cracks me up I started doing jokes about we work because my friend just paid to go to we work because he works from home fucking stupid and then he was bitching about sitting in traffic i'm like you're doing this to yourself you're paying for an office and you're sitting in traffic like my two worst nightmares yeah. and now you're bitching about it like you don't need to do this. yeah but people go like i have to get out of the it's the <laughs> like what are it's you- having that some sort of accountability of 
Because I'll let it slip. When I tell myself, it's 8 a.m. Yeah. Clocking in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I'm off the road. I don't have a meeting at 8 a.m. It's my own work. And then like I'm staying the night like at my boyfriend's. And he goes on tour all the time because he's not a comedian, but he's a musician. Mm-hmm. Thank God, not a comedian. But like, <laughs> and then I'll go like, oh, I'll just sleep in. This is nice. And then fucking. Yep. I know. Ca- and then I go into, oh, I have to do everything at once. And then. God, this is, you might have just like. We're going to do it. I'll do it. All right. I I ask um, the same two questions at the end of every podcast. Ooh. What is your biggest defective character or thing that you are vice or thing you're working against right now that you is getting in your, that internal or external, but usually like what resistance do you have to overcome? Um, I think right now it's, uh, it's internal. It's letting go. And it's been a, an ongoing thing, but letting go of the f- of the fear or concern of how people perceive me, mm. like worrying about being, I, I have like this deep seated fear of being perceived as crazy, mm. like legitimately like a mm-hmm. cra- like being written off, like for sharing like an honest thought, mm-hmm. having people be like, oh, you're a raving lunatic. Mm-hmm. So letting go of, and it, and it affects my comedy too, and, but just like daily life, letting go of worrying about what people think if I actually say how I feel mm-hmm. is my biggest hurdle. Defective character, I guess that's sort of like a self-absorbed victim. I'm just trying to be more, but like, I don't know. It's, it's people pleasing. P- yes. I mean, if that's the, if you're going to take what you're working on, the, I would say, and like figure out what the defective character is, it's, it's this like people desire to, please please everyone Mm. and you can't and you'll go fucking nuts it's Mm -hmm. like that too and it's like letting and there's so much i I just have so many like issues around identity of like when there's things i get into or start doing where i feel like i have to like yeah i meditate but like you know i'm just fucking a little bit i'm not like a fucking hippie and it's like yeah why are you so worried about someone thinking you're a hippie (laughs) who cares like yeah people pleasing that's a hundred percent it is just going you know what some people are maybe not gonna like I you. do love that like mantra in the rooms um and in the twelve step rooms is of how how they feel about you is none of my business. Yes. I love that. It's, That's helped me a lot in the past year, just reminding myself like how I can't take care of the everyone's perception of me. Yeah. And it's actually none of my business how they feel about me and I can't control it. Either. Yeah. You like if you have a feeling toward me, that's on you. It's the like, idea of yeah, but this is the weird thing is that we live in this culture that's telling us all the time, in, in particular in comedy, you like you have to be so worried about. We need to worry about every single person's feelings in the audience somehow make managing that. It's, and you're like, it's not no. realistic. No, it's also insane and unhealthy. Yeah. yeah, it's also like, oh, you're triggered. Yeah, it's like your triggers are your issue. Yeah, if something triggers you, that's a sign that you need to work on something. Yeah, not that I need to tap dance around it. Yeah. Like, yeah, we're life is hard. But when yeah. something you're like, that is just too upsetting. It's like, well, maybe you should explore that. I think I that is the thing about like wokeism that I hate the most is that it it talk about trigger. It triggers my childhood of walking on eggshells. Yes. I'm like, oh, so great. Now everywhere I fucking go, it's like when I was growing up and I have to like just walk on eggshells and take care of everyone in the world's feelings. Yeah. This is like a, a child of a narcissistic borderline personality disorders nightmare. Yes. And it's like now I'm afraid to order a black coffee is like where we're at. <laughs> yeah. That it's just like, what the fuck? N- no, like it's it's crazy. And it's also just like so much of it's so fucking phony. Then I'm like, what? If the people who are pointing their fingers and yelling the loudest, I'm like, who did you rape? Like, what yeah, if fucking, yeah. I can't wait for the skeletons in your closet to come out. Like, yep. if you can just go, everyone else is so bad. It's like, yeah, we've all fucked up. And we, like, what? Yeah. And what is your biggest asset? My biggest asset? Um, I would say it's gonna sound, it's very like hip. It doesn't matter. I don't need to explain. There we go. People pleasing. I don't want to sound... <laughs> Um, my ability, I think my biggest asset is my ability to love is not the word is to be sure that there's something good in everyone Mm -hmm. is that like, is to like my, my ability. And I think it just comes from where I come from is to know that like, like even if I disagree with someone or I misunderstand them, that like there was something lovable or like something in everyone that like, that they're just a human trying their best. Mm -hmm. And I, 
aside from severe mental illness, which impairs somebody, uh, somebody's ability to act in their most loving way or like with the, I truly believe that deep down, like all humans, are, we're just trying to connect and mm-hmm. like feel loved. And mm-hmm. so much of the animosity comes from like a place of fear or like just feeling like you're back. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I think, and it's a thing like I, I, I've always like admired about you is like the ability to like, because I get scared to like outwardly say things sometimes, but it's like the ability to like be somewhere in the middle and to, to be like on the bridge of like, I can see where you're coming mm-hmm. from. And I can also see where this person on the other side is coming mm-hmm. from. Like to, to not go to black and white yeah. and to like, to be able to engage with someone who goes, who's, I'm like, I don't agree with you, but like, let's talk about it. Let's figure out like where you're coming from, where I'm coming from. So even if at the end we don't agree, we can go, I understand. You. Yeah. I think that, you have an ability in your stand up in particular it's the reason that i love your your stuff is that thank you it gets into like our common humanity the experience of being human yeah. that we all share and i feel like right now we live in a time where that's just so important and we need it more than ever we need people who are out there joking about it and making that we all suffer from some version of mental illness, yeah, from, even the uh, healthiest. Yes. And it's like, we all have like fear and like we get embarrassed and, and like jealous and yes. yeah, these basic human emotions. It's it just, so you it go, just, I'm a bad person for feeling this way. And it's like, no, you're just a person. And it's not, but like some groups don't have ownership over these things no. more than others. Yeah. When it's like the more, the kind of mob mentality the more you get in with a group that makes you feel like it's okay for you to like feel this way or that way. It's like you lose that ability to see someone as an individual, as a human, Mm -hmm. especially with the internet, Mm -hmm. but to go like, it's easy to do. I do it. I mean, it's easy to just see someone as a political abstraction or an abstraction in general or a cartoon. You are my enemy. You are other, you are evil. And Mm -hmm. it's like, there are no, there's I, I've, there's people either write you off as good or bad and it's like that's not how this works no no i think yeah i don't i definitely appreciate what you're doing and i want everyone who's listening to follow you and check out your comedy Thank and you. tell us where we can find you and find out how to go see you live um you can find all of my social media instagram twitter and then facebook uh at jms comedy uh i have a podcast called ignorances hashtag blessed which i know is incorrect that's the point um, <laughs> some people are like it's blessed and i'm like i feel like you missed it um which i'm hopefully gonna get you on soon yeah and jmscomedy.com uh and click on the show's link and you will see where i'm coming um it's gonna be in tampa in november i'm slowing down on road stuff but i'm i always post my shows if you're in la i'm at the comedy store every week and i'll be uh on the road a bunch in december i'm doing an east coast tour so look awesome. out for that Amazing. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. We're going to Pomodoro. Yay. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. All right. Here we, we did it, check in. Check-in time. We're back. I'm back. Bridget was back last week. I've been back for weeks. I was bedridden. All alone. <laughs> All alone. Cold and alone talking to herself <laughs> in did. the middle of nowhere. It did feel like a bunker. Is there anyone alive out there? It was weird. I don't know how those people who do those podcasts where they just rant by themselves. You did a good job. You carried it off. Yeah. You got on a roll. It took you a minute, but you got there. Yeah. I feel like if I did it more often, I'd probably be just fine. Uh Uh-huh. But it felt really weird. Just screaming into the void. Uh Uh-huh. Which is Twitter, but it's not actually talking. Talking. You're not used to just standing there talking with no Being like, can you believe this crap? (laughs) Usually you have some sort of audience. What do you say, Hope? <laughs> <laughs> Hope is just snoring on the couch and I'm ranting into a microphone. So what's new, Maggie? How are you feeling now that you beat death at its game? <laughs> I'm I'm good. I'm better. I'm still, I feel like now I have to pick up the shambles that is my life after the holidays and then coming back and getting really sick. How was your, How were your holidays? Lovely, delightful, the blissful world of Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, you know what it's like. You've been there. I know. It's an idyllic situation. 
Um, you're you. If you have an you open door welcome to come back at all times, anytime you want. I know, and I as much as I love it and appreciate that, I hate going home for the holidays. I know. It's just a different. You have a different experience of it too, because you then have to see all your like. I I just you can have just our bunker own, so up. Yeah. yeah, you can hole up with your family, and I, I have to run around in the freezing tundra that is the New England and in the it was winter. Cold. You're complaining about the oh my god, it's freezing here in Los Angeles. Look. I'm cold, sick of the cold winter in Los Angeles. I was like, it was in the teens when I was home. Oh well, we don't have insulation here. <laughs> I know. I do remember that when when we first moved to LA, and we were. I was like, "What is happening? This is Los Angeles," and, and we were like, like, "I've never been so cold in my life." I've never. I've been saying that all winter here. Like, I've never been so cold in my life. Like huddled around the heater. It's true because you get drafts. It just gets cold. Nothing's built to withstand weather here. And this house is a hundred years old. <laughs> But yeah, I had a great time with my family, my nephews who are super adorable. I got to hang with my parents and just the three of us for a a good chunk of time, which was really nice. I kind of think I rarely get to do that. Did you survive World War III? (laughs) Maggie didn't even know World War III happened. Till I came back. Maggie probably slept through World War III too. Till I came back and we were doing prepping for the dumpster fire. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, when you're offline, I mean, I stayed in touch with the news and read what was going on, but it was just kind of like, That's oh, what's okay. so funny about Twitter is that, and I said this on Twitter yesterday, I said every other day on Twitter, World War Three or Civil War is trending and the rest of America is just like going to work. Tra-la-la. And because it, it's, that's where the biggest disconnect right. is. Is like, everything's fine, guys. Calm down. Right. And I probably won't know anything's happening until the bombs start falling. So I'm perfectly okay with that. <laughs> if I'll, it wasn't for dumpster fire, I would just be like, what? There's a culture war going on? <laughs> I didn't know there was a culture war going on until like last year. I know. Well, it's only because of you that I know. So... <laughs> <laughs> God, I miss being in the liberal, in the warm bosom of the liberal bubble. Now, I'm not even in the warm bu- bosom of the liberal bubble because you've certainly sh- popped that for me. But- no, but I'm saying I miss it before when I was. Yeah. And I didn't know any better. And I was just a L-tard. Uh-huh. <laughs> Libtard. A drunk <laughs> L-tard sitting at the end of the bar. Just a drunk lip tart sitting at the end of the bar, wondering how I didn't get very far. <laughs> Screaming about how you made up a word once. <sighs> Just wondering how my bank account is so low while I sneak into the bathroom and do another line of blow. <laughs> <laughs> These are the jingles that nobody <laughs> hears that I always appreciate. <laughs> For just off the cuff jingles are the best. That one wasn't in the key I wanted because suddenly <laughs> I decided that it sounded like a better country song. Uh, it went a little country there. I liked it. Another line of blow. Another line of blow. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I feel like if I was singing country, then I would probably know about the culture wars. So there's a little bit of disconnect it's there. True. It's true. <laughs> Well, and how was it? How about you? How were your holidays? They were go- they were great as holidays are. <laughs> that was super convincing. I was like, if you ask Elon Musk how his holidays are, like a robot or something. <laughs> they were great as holidays usually are for the <laughs> for the human species. People tend to enjoy them. <laughs> they seem to get a lot of comfort and connection out of them <laughs> it seems like something the humans enjoy <laughs> although they also seem to fight a lot with each other during these holiday times they spend together reluctantly but also joyfully <laughs> <laughs> um they were fine yeah they were good yeah, all, all is fine all is fine and I'm just feeling overwhelmed mm-hmm. and uh not in a bad way in a good way mm-hmm. just I I think that I feel I'm coming in. I'm just looking around. Even my office, everything feels disorganized to me. Uh huh. And I don't increasingly can't have disorganization because it just slows me down completely. Uh Uh 
And it's really not my strength. Once I'm or I actually say that, but I I like being organized. Right. And once and getting organized, even I'm decent at. I just haven't had time to get organized. And then I keep saying, I'm like, I'm gonna do this, and then I'll lose like an hour on Twitter, and then I'll get distracted by a last minute piece someone wants me to write all good things but the thing that gets pushed down is the is the organization right and then it's just like i keep throwing garbage in the back of my car and suddenly the back of your car is full of garbage yeah you are good at you are good at organizing when you have the time and you are good at certainly maintaining organization once it's been set up for you but I do feel like I'm I don't I'm not making enough money to get an assistant, but right. I need an assistant. Right. And if I can manage to get cross this. this channel, yeah. Yeah. then I'll be okay. And honestly, I I want to be, you know, I have it's just my it's also just a lot of my own bad habits. Mm -hmm. Procrastination, organization, and consistency are my three Everest to climb. Watch words for the year, for the decade. What's your one word for the year? Mine's consistency. I like that. Uh, I think I think I want to add creativity to that. Oh. Consistency and creativity. I like that. Uh, if I think if we can focus on those two things for the year, because I do feel like we astonished ourselves by being consistent with this podcast for over a year now last year was infrastructure year at fetacy inc uh -huh. what is this year going to be this year is going to be more infrastructure yeah no year. this is now like building now we're building the basement yeah building the building <laughs> building the building <laughs> 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 it's such a long road. Uh -huh. We haven't even built one house in our cul-de-sac. We yeah, yeah, last year was all like city planning and stuff like that. <laughs> What's your vision for this cul-de-sac? Now, last year now we like have to actually build it. Getting the pipes laid down uh -huh. for the freaking Getting the sewer sewage. lines connected. <laughs> <laughs> so that we can crank out a whole lot of shit. Yep. No, no, our content is amazing. Amazing bullshit. I love Dumpster Fire. I do too. For anyone, we never really talk about it on our check-in, which we should because we're idiots. I wouldn't know because I never listened to our podcast. But <laughs> in case you didn't know somehow, uh, we have a show on YouTube called Dumpster Fire with Bridget Fetacy. And it's on our Fetacy YouTube channel. Which you should subscribe to immediately. And like and share and ring the bell and all do all the Touch stupid- Touch my bells and buttons. Stupid stuff. But we are, we've got, this week was our 11th after our six week hiatus we took at the end of the year. We started mm -hmm. back up again this week. I love this week's episode. I love Dumpster Fire in general. Yes. It brings me so much joy. It's so fun. It's really like where I get to just be my crazy self. And we just have so much fun shooting it and then editing it. And It's a nice companion to walk-ins. It is. Walk-ins is like, Come in, have some tea, tell me your problems, and let's talk about intellectual things and dumpster fires, just, just wacky and yeah. zany. And like, and whatever, if it makes us laugh, then that's our standard. And it, it seems to make other people laugh too, because people love it. I know, I, but I'm thrilled to be back at it because it's I, the show it's that awesome. says what the masses are thinking, I think. <laughs> It's true. We even had someone shoot a parody video of it while we were on break so and send good. it to us. You need to see that. Yeah. So that's been, yeah, no. So just coming back and then being really, really sick. I haven't been that sick in years. I know. And it's it's tough because you came back after the new year and then it feels like you're just merging onto the freeway right. and the jalopy and, I'm just so and behind you're sick. And it's, yeah. And so now I feel like, all right, I'm just, it's not too late. Just lost it's not a week. too late. It's only the 15th. I know. But it's just, you know, I wanted to start the year off strong. So now I'm just like, all right, let's get my feet under me and yeah. let's get going. We, that have so is the worst. we have so much to do. We're going to build. We're going to build a cul-de-sac. We're going to build. And we have a big announcement coming next week. We do. Tune in on Monday. Check out Bridget's Twitter. Or Tuesday. Um, Tuesday. Yeah. Monday or Tuesday. And lots of good things. Oh, and make sure you watch Curb Curb Your Enthusiasm this week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
I'm not going to tell you why. <laughs> You're definitely going to want to watch it. <laughs> And with that, see if you can spot what we want you to spot. Walk-ins, welcome listeners. I leave you with this. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being a part of the fetacy cul-de-sac. And thank you for telling your friends about us and being loyal listeners. We love you. We look forward to another great year. Yeah, and we're going to have lots of, it's going to be, it's I, I, the future of this podcast is going to be dope because we're going on the road. Yeah. We're, we've got a lot of plans. Now we just need to implement them. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think the sky's the limit for us here at Watkins. Welcome. <laughs> I do too. If these other idiots can do it, we can, Maggie. That's my <laughs> mantra. I like that mantra. <laughs> We'd like to thank our sponsor, Fetacy Incorporated, for their amazing support. Fetacy Incorporated is a brand that brings you... Laughter and joy. (laughs) (laughs) Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank Ricochet, our composer Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. <laughs>